All right, friends, how many of you have a, a favorite hole in the wall place you like to go eat? Yeah, those are the best places, right? Paints falling off the walls, if they even have walls, right? <laughs> so uh, several years ago, Gloria and I, had we were going, going to one of our favorite hole in the wall places. It's a great Cajun place on the island, and uh, we hadn't been there in quite a while. And surprisingly, uh, Gloria didn't know what she wanted uh, when we got there. And so she started reading the menu. It was a handwritten menu because this is a hole in the wall place, amen? Ain't got no printed menus here. And so she was reading through, she read through every single thing on the board. And believe it or not, even after she went through everything, she still couldn't decide what she wanted. Now, I don't know if you know this about Gloria, but she is not Cajun. And so she read the menu again and when she was going through it, she saw something that didn't sound familiar to her. She looked at it, and then she looked at the guy behind the counter, and she asked him, what's a, what's a cola? <laughs> now, I am, I got Cajun in me, but even me, I had never heard of a cola. So I was like, yeah, what is a cola? And the guy was like, what? And she looked at it, she goes, what's a cola? And he was like, a Coca-Cola? <laughs> now let me ask you, you probably heard before, there is no such thing as a dumb question. Did Gloria ask a dumb question? No, she did not, and if I see your head shaking yes, I'm gonna tell her. <laughs> that was not a dumb question because she was reading the menu, well, at least that one word, <laughs> in Spanish, right? And it made sense. if. You're reading it in a different language, you have to understand what's being written. And if you don't, then you ask a question. The question makes sense if you understand where the question was coming from. Y'all with me? I tell you that story because I think, honestly, when we read a passage like what we just read from Mark, it's one of those home run passages for preachers. They, preachers love this kind of passage. Jesus asked the question, but who do you say that I am? And preachers just love to just dig on that and they want to point the finger. And who do you say Jesus is, right? But right before that, it's really kind of a strange question if you don't understand. Jesus takes his disciples on the way to Caesarea Philippi and he asks them a question. Not who do you say I am. First, he asks them what question? Who do people say that I am? And if you Think of it, that's a weird question. Like if I were to ask you, hey Mario, uh, who do people say that I am? You'd be like, uh, John? Like, what are they gonna call you, Bartholomew, right? That's, that's not the question, right? But if you notice in the reading, the disciples, they knew the answer to Jesus' question. Who do people say that I am? Well, some say Elijah, the prophet. Some say John the Baptist. Or other people still say you're one of the other older prophets. Now, you have to understand, the people, they didn't believe in reincarnation, so it's not like they thought, oh man, John the Baptist, he was beheaded a couple of chapters ago, and now he's come back to life in Jesus. Or Elijah never died in Scripture, apparently, and so now he's come back to it. They didn't believe in reincarnation like that. And so when the people are saying, yeah, we think he's John the Baptist, we think he's uh, Elijah the prophet or one of the other prophets, they aren't talking about like who he is. They're talking about, in a sense, kind of his persona. Maybe his attitude and his passion. Maybe even the style of ministry that he had. And I know a lot of us, we tend to think of Jesus as, as meek and, and mild. He was soft-spoken and, and maybe he was well-behaved in church. And maybe that's all true. But listen to the people who actually listened to him and saw him in real life. And when people wondered, who is this guy? A couple of the responses was, man, he reminds us of Elijah. Elijah was a bad dude. That prophet, he spoke truth. Other people say, he's John the Baptist. John the Baptist was crazy. He was the cricket-eating, locust-eating guy out by the river, right? You remember him? And that's who they compared Jesus to. So maybe Jesus was tender and mild, but maybe 
maybe there's a way to point him to a different kind of attitude that Jesus had, an important part of who he was that often we miss. So Jesus asked him the question, who do people say that I am? I'm not sure Jesus was looking for like a, a summary. He was trying to take a, poll, a polling of, of what people thought about him. I think he was preparing the disciples so that he could ask the next question, which is the preacher's favorite question to ask the congregation. Okay, okay. But who do you say that I am? Jesus wants to know if his disciples can now see who he really is. That is, that they can really see who he came to be and what he came to do. I'm sure Jesus already knew what the people thought. He had already heard the rumblings. He had already heard the crowds. He already knew their answer. In a sense, he already knew the disciples' answer. But, but, but I wonder if part of this, as we read these two questions, who do people say that I am? Who do you say that I am? There is the fact that there's an answer that the people can have that might be well and good, that might speak some truth to who Jesus is. But there's a different answer that you have when you actually walk with Jesus. That there is a, a more meaningful, deeper understanding of the answer to the question, who is Jesus, when you are walking with him on the way, wherever Jesus may take you, on the way, wherever the Holy Spirit prompts you to go, that when you are walking with Jesus by your side, there is an answer you couldn't have otherwise. But who do you say I am? Now, I want us to appreciate that this wasn't a random out of the blue question. It wasn't like Jesus was just on the way. He's trying to fill time as they're walking to Caesarea Philippi. Up to this point in Mark's telling of the gospel, if we were to read it all from chapters one through eight again, we would see that the disciples, they have heard Jesus teach great things. They have heard his preaching they have seen him do miracles. They have been sent out themselves, two by two, if you remember that story. Jesus gave them authority to, to speak and to do miracles themselves, and they did these things. They had heard Jesus preach. They had seen these things happen. They had participated in these miracles. But still, Jesus, even after that, had to ask them another question before the ones we're talking about today. This is what he asked them. Do you have eyes but fail to see and ears but fail to hear? In other words, he'd seen all these wonderful things, but they still weren't seeing who Jesus was. Now, I want to take a pause right here because... Uh, in our online Bible study on Wednesdays, we've been learning about the Psalms, and uh, we talked about several times that word Selah. If you ever read the Psalms, it's written about 74, 75 times in the Old Testament. Most of the times it's in the Psalms, and we don't quite know what it means, right, the word. We have, there's some ideas, there's some understanding of what that word might mean, but what we think it might mean Whenever you see that word, you're reading through the Psalms and, you know, you're, you're going through verses 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Then you see off to the side this word, Selah, what we think it means is a break. Pause. Right? So this is the worship of the people of God. And so they are singing these songs and, and there's music behind them, loud music. Rudy's got the, 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 the organ put up all the way and the, the windows are shaking and Ash is going to town and we're all singing praise to God and, and then that word comes and we all pause so that we can give praise to God in a different way so that we can reflect on what we just heard and what we just sang together and so I, I, I want this to be a holy pause for a second I want you to pay attention Jesus asked the disciples before not too long ago like, what is it that you can't see? Even though you, you've been a part of all these great things. But then later on, not too far after that, not too long after that, he asked them another question. But who do you say that I am? Let's pause and thank God because 
Even when we get the answer wrong the first time, God does not give up on us the second time. That even though we've had things wrong before, God doesn't say, well, get away from me forever. Instead, God still calls us in. The love of God never, ever turns away from us, sisters and brothers. Praise be to God. That is worth a praise. Amen. Amen. God doesn't give up on us. And tell the truth, a lot of us, we're, we're real quick to give up on each other, aren't we? Well, he said, mm, and she said, and he did. Like, you ain't never done nothing yourself or said nothing yourself, right? But when it's somebody else, I'm done with them. That's how we are. But praise the Lord, that's not how God is. God doesn't turn away from us when we come to church with our grumpy feelings and attitudes and or when we leave and we're more excited about what's going on in the world of the NFL, number one back there. I love the jersey, but if I'm more excited about that green color than I am about the Holy Spirit, something wrong, something backwards, right? But God doesn't give up on me, even if I got it backwards. Jesus is still the one to say, all right, all right, all right. But who do you say I am? And I wonder if that question is a chance for us to reorientate ourselves again. When, when we know the answer, we've heard the answer, maybe we've professed the answer before. But to hear the question that Jesus asked those disciples, maybe to hear it again and have it fresh in our minds is a chance for us to say, I know this. Why have I been acting like I don't know this? God still gives us a chance to answer the question, who do you say I am? Amen and amen. And what I say to you is, church, that's grace. And again, for those of us who aren't always so gracious ourselves, that may sound like a different language. Grace? What's grace? Grace is the love of God. Grace is how we experience the mercy and the compassion of God. And when you understand grace, when you understand that about who Jesus is, you get that you're never too far gone, that you can't follow Jesus right here and right now. When you understand grace, as the language of the love of God, you understand that today is always a new day for us. Now, there's something else imp to, important to remember about this story. Again, the question Jesus asked, it wasn't random. It wasn't filler. Mark tells us that Jesus took his disciples to a place called Caesarea Philippi. And what I'll remind you or tell you about this place is that it was a major place for pagan and Caesar worship. And by all accounts, I don't know what comes to your mind when you think of pagan worship, you know, and some, some of us are, you know, when it comes to Halloween, we don't like to go to the store, we don't like to see all the scary stuff, because oh, that's, that's, you know, we don't like all that. So I don't know if that's the kind of image you have when you think of pagan worship. But by all accounts, Caesarea Philippi, was an impressive, beautiful place of pagan and Caesar worship, but a beautiful place nonetheless. Many, many shrines that people would come from all over to worship at. As far as I understand, at the time of Jesus, this wasn't a, an actual city necessarily where people lived. It's a place where people came just for this experience of, of, their, of their worship. And so when you went and you saw all these shrines, and they also had this white marble temple, beautiful white marble temple dedicated to Caesar. When you saw all this, it was hard to ignore the power and the prestige that meant the emperor had. See, you and I, we hear Jesus is Lord, and what do we say to that? 
hopefully with a little more, mm, but we say, amen. But what you have to realize, people would say the same thing about Caesar. They would say, Caesar is Lord. And in their own way, they would amen that. They had songs about it. If they saw Caesar, ever had the chance they'd be anywhere close to him, they would yell out, Caesar is Lord. And so we can be careful. We might think it's just a little cute church thing, but it's actually it's, a, it's an Elijah the prophet, John the Baptist thing to say. Jesus is Lord. But in a place like Caesarea Philippi, you couldn't help but feel like, dang, Caesar is Lord. Have you seen this place? This is the kind of place that proves how awesome Caesar is and how awesome all these other gods are. But it was at this place of beauty, this place with this white stone temple, that Jesus began to talk about something less alluring. It's hard to escape the beauty of the place. But in the middle of all that beauty, Jesus began to talk about suffering. His suffering. Now, did you notice that when Peter answered Jesus' question, who do you say that I am? Jesus told the disciples to not tell anyone. Right? It always seems kind of strange. Why wouldn't you want people to know that? And I wonder if part of it is, well... Jesus hadn't got to this meaty part yet. Because Mark tells us, he told the disciples, don't tell everybody that answer you just had. It's a good answer. Right on. Amen. You got the right answer. But don't tell anybody. But then Mark says, Jesus plainly began to to teach the disciples about what he knew was about to happen to him. And I wonder if part of it is, look, don't go telling people Jesus is Lord just yet because you ain't heard the other half of this, and you might not be ready for it yet. You might not be ready for everything that this entails. Jesus began to plainly teach about what was about to happen to him, and we can say that what was about to happen is that he was about to put the language of grace into great action. And it was going to be something the world would never forget. People like you and me would still be thanking God for it thousands of years later. Amen. So we see Jesus plainly saying all this. And what we see from that is that Jesus understood his suffering. It only affirmed who he really was. You know what? Caesar, he needs that beautiful white marble shrine, that temple. He needs it. I don't. And while you may see suffering as a setback, as a defeat, Jesus begins to teach his disciples that it only affirms what Peter just said about him. He is the Messiah. The disciples, followers of Jesus, Christians, let me tell you what kind of Messiah he is. He didn't need the beauty of the marble temple or of the other shrines because he had the cross. The cross didn't deny his power. It demonstrated it. And so he begins to tell the crowds, because you remember Peter's response. is like, Jesus, what are you talking about? So Jesus turns to the, to the crowds who are with him and says, look, if anybody wants to follow me, what you're going to have to do is deny yourself and take up your cross. And you can almost see the people with the confused look on their face asking Jesus, cross. what's a cross? You know what a cross is. It's that big wooden thing. Probably looks more like a a lowercase t. It's not gold. It's made of strong wood so nobody falls from it. 
We want to keep them sturdy up there so they can't escape. We want to make sure that when we tie them down, they don't accidentally fall, that when we nail them there, nothing breaks except for their bones, their spirit, and their life. What's a cross? You know what a cross is. You've just been looking at it wrong. You just haven't understood this language of grace yet and how God was about to blow the doors open on Hades. To make the grace of God known throughout the world, to give the people of God a constant renewed sense of empowerment, assurement of their salvation, conviction of their sin, but the renewal of their heart. Sisters and brothers, Jesus had been bringing the disciples along the way to this place of Caesarea Philippi, I think, so that he could now show them the rest of the way, the rest of the way of God, which is the way of the cross. He was going to show them God's way to victory was through his suffering. And that if you and I are going to make sense of Jesus, we have to make sense of the cross. Now, Mark tells us that Jesus began to teach this to his disciples. He didn't just tell them, oh, by the way, uh, the cross, right? He had to teach them this. And I think part of the reason he had to teach them instead of just tell them is that it wasn't just something to know. It was something to understand, it was something to accept, and it was something to follow. It's just like when we were kids. How many of you learned two plus two equals four? Right? They didn't tell you that. They taught you that. They taught you how two plus two equals four. So that then later on you could could play with other numbers and learn that three plus two doesn't equal four, it equals what? Are you sure? Yes, you're you're right. Very good. So that then you could add other numbers and do things with those numbers. And then you could do even more. You, You can also subtract numbers. You can multiply. You can divide. You can do trigonometry. But you start with what the basic understanding is that you have to learn. And I think that's what Jesus is doing here. He didn't just tell them, oh, I want you to pay attention. Things are going to get a little rough, just so you know. No, Jesus was teaching them that if you want to understand the language of God's grace, you have to understand the cross. If you are going to experience the grace of God, you have to understand the cross as well. I also think Jesus wanted to teach his disciples about his suffering so they could understand what their ministry might look like too. See, I know today a lot of Christians, we, we, we want to hear lessons about, oh, teach me how to live my best life and, and, and teach me what it means to be blessed and, and, and how, do I, how do I have a, a great family and, and how do I... And these are all good questions, right? But if you notice, it's not the first question that Jesus asked. It's not the first lesson, or the most important lesson, that our answers for all those other things come from what we understand about the cross of Christ. So that to understand, we find purpose, we find direction, we find inspiration, we might find conviction, but we certainly find our way as we begin to understand the wisdom of the way of the cross. Sisters and brothers, that is our way. And I know you know this, that is not the way of how the world works outside of here. That's not the way Caesar's worship would have been. It wasn't the way of Caesar. It's not the way of any power other than God's today. And so we need to know that. We 
didn't know that. We're going to find where God is leading us. Yeah, who do you say Jesus is? And how do you make sense of the cross? How do we make sense as a church of the cross? We need to figure that out together as well. Because as we do, we learn more and more the language of grace that God wants to speak to our hearts. In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Thanks be to God.